Good afternoon, everybody. This workshop is called Designing Authentic Service Learning Experiences, Promoting Real-World Applications in the Classroom. And today with us, we have Jill Stefaniak. Uh, the ob objective of this session is to explore service learning as a means of enhancing student learning through real-world application, excuse me, real-world applied and experiential learning opportunities through an examination of theory, research, and practice in both face-to-face -face and online instructional settings, we will offer specific strategies to design service learning experiences that combine theory and practice. Session participants will leave this session with the tools they need to incorporate service learning activities within their coursework. Okay. Well, thank you. So just to kind of recap, what the purpose of today's workshop is, is to explore the practical application of service learning as a means to enhance our student learning through real world applied and experiential learning opportunities. So what my goal for today's workshop is that hopefully by the end of this workshop, everyone will leave here with an idea of how they're going to implement service learning in their respective courses. Um, and if we haven't done that, please find me afterwards, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna all be able to accomplish that this afternoon. Just to kind of give you a brief overview of my experience with service learning, I've had a lot of um, opportunity over the past several years to do a lot of different types of service learning projects. I've done large scale, small scale, face-to-face -face instruction. I've done e-service learning. I've done online service learning. Um, prior to coming, I'm, right now I'm an assistant professor of instructional design and technology here at Old Dominion University. And one of the um, things that I've been trying to do is, it, instructional design is very much, it's an applied field. We look at studying how people learn, what instructional strategies yield the best learning outcomes, and we try and do research on that. But the best way to teach our students how to do that is actually having them go out and develop instruction. And so this is where service learning falls in really nicely for, for my area of study. Prior to coming to Old Dominion University, I did a lot of um, work in medical education. And one of my previous positions, um, I was a director of education training for, at a local medical school, and I was responsible for finding opportunities for our medical students to go out into the community. We did a lot of interprofessional education with our nursing partners and allied health professionals so that we could always kind of see what the whole community is doing and that we can kind of join forces that way. I've gotten NIH grants to do needs assessments on vulnerable populations where we've then taken the results of that to develop medical education um, partnerships with local libraries to develop um, resources uh, for, for the vulnerable populations in the area. I've worked with faculty to develop and coordinate service learning activities, because sometimes when we talk about this, it just seems like it's a lot of work and people don't necessarily know where to start. I've been in that role before, similar to Emily Eddins, as or, you know, how, how do you get started? How, how do you organize it? And then how, how do you follow it along and measure it throughout the semester? And I've been responsible for identifying and networking with community partners. And so I understand what the community partners are looking for. I also understand what we need from the academic side of things as well. What I have done here at Old Dominion is I have tried to incorporate service learning into a variety of my courses. And I'm, I'm, we're going to kind of go through a few of these in, in detail just to kind of give you examples. And hopefully you'll be able to kind of see maybe how you might be able to link this into your own coursework, even though um, we're all coming in from different disciplines. Um, I teach a course called Consulting Skills for Instructional Designers. The purpose of that course is that for our instructional design students are actually going to go out and they're going to create an instructional design project. They're going to find a client, they're going to create instruction for them, and they're going to follow it along. The purposes of this is to teach them how to negotiate and how to interact and coordinate with a client. Because we all know in our, in our respective fields, we teach everything in a really perfect and safe environment. And then our students graduate and they go out in the workforce and they find out things aren't always that that neat and clean. Sometimes things are messy. Sometimes they're going to have to multitask. Um, we might have covered something, you know, piece by piece if we're teaching a, a particular instructional model. And then they get out in the real world and realize they're juggling three or four phases at the same time. And it's not quite what we, we taught them in class. So this is a really good opportunity for them to see the messy side of things, but to also gain that real world experience that they can add to their um, resumes, they can add to their portfolios and showcase what they've done um, when they're seeking employment after graduation. I also did a course here too. Um, last summer we did needs assessment and analysis where I wanted my graduate students to get experience conducting needs assessments. I also wanted them to um, get experience as to some of the nuances that can come up with data collection. Um, this happened to be at the time where I had met um, Emily Eddins here at Old Dominion and knew that we had a brand new service, uh, director of service learning. Um, one of the great things about that is that there's so much opportunity here for her to grow in her position. 
one of the bad things about that, and I'm sure Emily will attest to this, that they never had one before. And so where do you start? Um, you don't have anything to really look back on. So Emily was really having to come in here and just move forward. There wasn't really any looking back. Um, what my class did was we conducted a, a local community needs assessment for Emily. And we were gathering data for her that she's actually been using this past year to help drive some of the service learning initiatives that we're experiencing today. Um, and then this summer, I'm teaching designing online instruction. And what the goal is, is after working with Emily, we've been doing some research together, we're actually getting ready to put together a faculty forum where we're going to be providing um, resources and educational materials and instructional modules to help faculty implement service learning in their courses. And so my students are going to be working on designing that this summer as a part of a service learning component in class. I will be guiding that um, with them. Um, so it will be a group project that's going to involve the instructor. Um, it's going to allow me to have a little bit more control. We don't want everybody to go totally rogue um, on us because we are hoping that we'll be able to implement that um, this fall. But again, a lot of different opportunities of doing a variety of types of service learning projects. My latest baby um, that I'm very proud of is Designers for Learning. Designers for Learning is a nonprofit organization that was started a year ago um, with Jennifer, um, Dr. Jennifer Madrell, who is actually a graduate of Old Dominion University, I believe in 2010, 2011. And what we do is we identify learning opportunities to provide service learning um, using e-service learning, so everything is done virtually, for instructional um, design students across the country. And so we identify nonprofits um, that have, have a need or have an instructional need. And we coordinate, coordinate different activities. We work with multiple universities. Um, we worked with our first uh, project that we did. We coordinated with 19 different uh, um, graduate programs in, in the United States, um, whether it was independent studies, students that were seeking um, experiences. And we, we've guided that. So I've, I've, had the, um, I've had the experience, too, of working with the logistical nightmares that can sometimes arise with, with service learning when it comes up. But just to recap, and I'm sure hopefully by the end of today, everyone's going to leave and they're going to know what service learning is, because I'm sure it's being repeated in every single uh, um, workshop or session that you're attending. But service learning is a teaching and learning strategy that integrates meaning, uh, meaningful community service with instruction and reflection to enrich the learning experience, teach civic responsibility, and strengthen communities. And so one thing that we want to make sure that we have, we want to make sure that we have three things in, in, in hand. We want to make sure that we have, we're meeting a community need. We want to make sure that we're fulfilling the, the needs of our own, our course curricular objectives. So we want to make sure we're not just creating a random assignment just for the sake of creating an assignment or creating a, a community project just for the sake of creating one. We really want to see that bridge with the curricular objectives and the community needs. And then last but not least, we want to make sure that we have our students engaging in reflective practice because it's really important that they're looking back and they're being able to make those connections to see what, what they're doing actually relates to what they're studying. I totally lifted this from uh, Emily's handout, but um, this summarizes the, the benefits of service learning. We've got student benefits. It, it, it's integrative and meaningful experiential learning. It's giving them real world experiences. They're having the opportunity to um, develop as professionals. They're collaborating with others. They're being exposed. They're contributing to their communities. Faculty benefits. It opens up doors to diverse research opportunities. Um, you're exploring community practices and being able to tie in different perspectives in the course content that you're teaching. And you're broadening your teaching approach and strategies. And then last but not least, the community benefits from all of this because it helps the organization meet their diverse needs. Um, and again, we've got, um, we're enhancing and we're, um, developing civically um, responsible um, individuals. Research shows that students who engage in civic responsibility in their undergraduate programs continue to do so when they graduate. And so that's something that we want to think about too. We want to have that sustainability over time so that our students, our graduates, as they're leaving Old Dominion, they're continuing um, active involvement in their, com in their community. Another reason why we're doing this, it's a really exciting time, I think, to be here at Old Dominion University. Um, when we look at the mission statement here at ODU and we look at the very bottom, we're a dynamic public research institute that serves its students and enriches the Commonwealth of Virginia, the nation, and the world through rigorous academic programs, strategic partnerships, and active civic engagement. It says it right there in our mission, so we, why not embrace it? And so when we think about, let's just take a, a recap of this past year. In 2014, we had a, an assistant director of service learning was hired. Since then, we've had monthly service learning workshops. 
We've had service learning faculty grants. We had eight grants that were awarded this past spring. We have online service learning faculty grants that are coming out, and I know they've been making their pitches on that. Um, we're going to be having a designation of, of, of service learning courses in the course catalog so that students are actually going to get credit for, taking, for participating in a course that has a service learning component. Um, I, I looked, last time I checked, we have 35 courses as of spring 2015 that were actually um, integrating uh, service learning or were declaring that they um, had service learning components. There might even be a few more that um, went unnoticed um, or unreported. We have nine new courses that are being developed for the 2014-2015 academic year, and we have eight courses in development for the 2015-2016 academic year. And so when you look at all of this and see what, see what we've done as an institution this past year, it's really exciting, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens next year. I'm hoping that we've had about you know, 200 faculty have been attending this workshop these last two days. It'll be really interesting to see where are we at um, this time next year. And so hopefully so that we can increase our numbers for next year, the session objectives today that we're going to leave with is that by the end of today's workshop, we're all going to be able to distinguish between volunteerism and service learning. Um, we're going to be able to explore the implications that authentic service learning experiences can have on the design of coursework. We're going to identify suitable service learning activities that align with your course goals and identify potential service learning partnerships within our community. So one of the things just to be very clear on, and oftentimes these things get mixed up. Um, when we talk about um, volunteerism and service learning, they are two very different things. Volunteerism, it's not linked to course objectives. So we don't need to be enrolled in a course to volunteer. You could have a volunteer requirement in your course by assigning students and telling them that you want them to go out for, you know, and, and volunteer for so many hours um, within the community. That would count as volunteerism. It does not have to be the same assignment for all of your students. It can just be a, a one-time deal, and there doesn't have to be any follow-up. So you don't have to have your students reporting back to you, or you don't have to have your students reflecting on this. You don't have to have any assessments linked to this. And this is where we see a lot of our student groups here at Old Dominion embrace, volunteer, embrace um, volunteerism, and they're going out in the community. When we look at service learning, it's going to be integrated with course objectives so that we can justify as we're developing the activity, we can say, okay, this is meeting this, this curricular objective's need. Um, it's meeting both the community and the curricular needs. One thing I really like, um, I've heard Emily say in a lot of our conversations, we're building a reciprocal relationship with our community partners. So we're not just serving the community, but we're also making sure that we're serving our students' needs as well. And again, we're incorporating reflective practice. And then this is where assessment and all those other issues come into play, which we'll talk about later today. And again, just to kind of look at it this way, service learning is really comprised of three different components. We have academic coursework, work-based applied learning, giving them those real experiences those, in those situated learning environments, and then community service. And so you're here today, so you're, you're, you're going to do service learning. And right now when we talk about it, we're talking about bridging, building that connection. We're going to bridge course, course objectives to meeting a community need. You're, we're going to go out, you're going to find a community partner, you're going to develop something, you're going to launch it in your course. And it sounds like it's going to be a smooth project. And then you start planning. And can I get a show of hands? Raise your hand if you've already implemented a service learning project before. Has it, always go, has it always gone as planned? Right. Have you, have you had to do a lot of planning for it? It's not something that you can put together the night before and say, OK, I'm getting ready to post this week's modules on, on Blackboard. I'm going to come up with a unique case study. Oh, let's do a service learning project. This is something you want to prepare you know, months, months in advance to make sure that you've worked out all of the kinks and you've thought of all of the worst case scenarios that could possibly um, arise. And so some of the challenges that come up, and, it, and it's really important that we, we recognize what the challenges are with implementing service learning. Not to scare anybody away, but just so that we can plan ahead of time. It's time consuming. It's very time consuming dealing with the project's logistics. You want to make sure that you're, that you're networking, that you're working with, with your community partner. You want to make sure that you're communicating clear objectives to your students. You want to make sure that your students are actually carrying out the project. You want to make sure you don't have any rogue students. Um, we actually had a, I had a project I was working on with Designers for Learning this past year 
where one of our students didn't like um, the path that we were giving them, and so she contacted our client on her own and was offering um, different services. And of course, it came back to us, and she was removed from the project. Um, that was only a one-time deal, and I don't anticipate that happening too often. But again, you want to make sure that you've got follow-up. You know where your students are. You, you know what they're, what they're going to be delivering when they're interacting with the, with the client. And again, it's really important, too, to fi find the right fit for your, fit, fit for your class. But why do it? It builds upon and enhances course concepts. It helps students understand the relevance of what they're learning. And it promotes civic engagement. So one of the challenges that I have is that there are times where I have to teach certain concepts in class that they're being taught in every instructional design program across the country. They have to know this stuff. And the students have a really hard time sometimes wrapping their head around things. But when I can actually tie it to an activity, or I can have them go out and do a real life project, it makes it so much easier when I can say, hey, remember when you did, when you did this? This is how it links to this instructional theory. Or this, these are the challenges that we've talked about. It also, it grooms them and prepares them um, for what the real life experiences are going to be like when they get out there in, um, in the workforce. And so why do we do it? You dangle the carrot. You, you dangle the faculty carrot. All the presentations today, this is a great opportunity to do research. It's a great opportunity to do collaborative interprofessional education projects. Um, as I was talking and sitting through some of the presentations, there's a lot of ways you can overlap and work with people in different disciplines, which looks good for getting grants. It looks good for research and getting publications. Why should the students do it? It provides real life experience. What I tell all my students when they're in my classes is that these are things that they can list on their resumes or their CVs. Um, the students this summer who are going to be in my designing online instruction class, um, Emily's actually, we're going to be providing them a letter that will say during you know, the summer semester, they worked on the following things. And we're, and we're going to sign that. Emily's willing to do that for, um, for the other courses, depending on what it is. So that these are things, I know we just came from an e-portfolio session. Students could actually archive that and say, I've got a letter documenting that I was involved in this particular project. I met this community need. And that's the carrot, too, especially as our students are, are trying to be competitive and trying to vie for whether it's graduate school um, or jobs. And so again, what we want to do is we want to make sure everyone leaves today feeling like they have this bridge and, and not, the, not the other one. So what I want you to do right now is, um, if you've got a piece of paper out, I want you to think about a class that you currently teach. I want you to think about a class that you want to integrate or implement a service learning component. You probably have assigned reading. You're teaching foundational course concepts. You're demonstrating. You're, you're, you want them to be able to demonstrate a proficiency in the subject area by the end of the semester. And you're hoping that your students look like this. They're coming to school prepared. They all have their books. They're all happy to be here. And then we get students like this. And they look at us and they tell us, well, this is hard. I don't understand what I'm reading. Then they tell us that they're never going to use this when they leave, even though we might, know, we might know otherwise. And so it's really important that we kind of think about why we should do this. I'm constantly reminding students of the relevance of service learning activities. You don't just do it once, do it continuously and explain to them, by the end of this project, you're going to get the following out of this. This is how this is going to meet these curricular needs. Don't, don't just have it on the assignment. Make sure that you're constantly um, going over that with them. And that too, that you're letting them know that it promotes civic engagement. And so what I want to do is I really want to make this more of an active experience. And I see we have a lot of people sitting at different tables. So I'm hoping that as you're going through this workshop today, you can share some of your ideas. Um, I'm going to be walking around the room. And I know Emily, as she's um, going to be kind of popping in and out, she's going to be walking around the room, too, just to offer some insight. But let's start planning your service learning experience. So right now, I want to give you a couple of minutes. I want you to think about a course that you're teaching or that you're going to be teaching that you want to implement service learning. How many students do you have? Because that's, that's going to determine a few things. Um, course delivery, is it face-to-face? -face? Is it online? Is it blended? Are you dealing with distance students? Are they all local? What challenges do students typically encounter with your course, con with your course content? We all know we have those certain areas in the classes we teach, and we say, you know, every single semester when I teach this, the students always struggle with this particular part of the course. Write that down, because let's see if we can implement a service learning project that can help them um, overcome that challenge. 
And then I also want you to take a couple of minutes and jot down what challenges do you encounter with delivering the course content. And so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll move on to the next, the next phase. everyone had a chance to jot down this information? Okay. So here's an, here's an example for, for moving forward with this. So this is the course catalog. This is my instructional design course, Consulting Skills for Instructional Designers. And here are the desired learning outcomes. So I want every all of my students, when they leave, I want them to be able to identify performance problems, opportunities, and needs, develop and negotiate a consulting proposal, make appropriate recommendations, and maintain a positive client relationship throughout a consulting process. And we're all going to have different, you know, this is obviously specific to my course, we're all going to have different desired learning outcomes. Just to kind of give you an example of the needs assessment project that we did. Emily's office approached us. They wanted to foster a positive relationship with Lambert's Point, which many of us are familiar with as a neighborhood near the ODU campus. They wanted to um, build a stronger sense of community with our local students. She wanted to establish a system for following up with current service learning community partners. Oftentimes in that um, industry, we notice that volunteer directors and executive directors, they, they change a lot. There's a lot of turnover. Um, your contact that you might have had a year or two ago is somebody completely different. And so it's being able to try and keep up to date records. Um, she wanted to be able to identify new potential community partners, expand the number of service learning projects with faculty, and then eventually be able to conduct a network analysis. And so what our process was, and this is again just to kind of give you an example of how you could implement service learning in your course. We met with our client, who, who was Emily Eddins. We developed data collection tools for various target areas. They were reviewed um, by the client and the Office of Community Outreach because we didn't want our students going out representing Old Dominion and collecting data without having the appropriate people approve what they were asking. And then we had them, um, we had revisions that were made based on the feedback we received from, from the Office of Community Outreach and, uh, and Emily. Uh, we conducted uh, data collection and then we presented our preliminary results. And these were our four areas. I had a mix of students. I think I only had two local students and everybody else was scattered across the country. And I had one international student in that semester. And so the way that we did this, um, I made sure that one of my local students was involved in the working with Lambert's Point piece of this project. She actually drove around and was checking things out and taking pictures for the distance students. Um, we came up with ideas and had online meetings. We used Adobe Connect um, to have the students brainstorm how they might collect data 
There was a lot of things that they could do by accessing things online, different resources online. We had students that were interviewing faculty from a distance. We, we, um, for any of you, if you participated in our survey last summer, thank you. Um, but we, we were conducting phone interviews and, and we did some surveys with faculty, gauging what their interest was and trying to identify challenges that they were facing in terms of implementing service learning. But this was just an example of some of our targets and how we did this as a mix with local students um, and students at a distance. What I want you to think about right now though with the course that you're developing, I, I shared with you what my desirable learning outcomes were for, that, for my consulting class. I want you to come up with what are your desirable learning outcomes? What do you want your students to be able to achieve when they leave your course? And if you can write those down. And we'll start sharing them in a couple of minutes. Do I have a volunteer or a couple of volunteers in the crowd that want to let us know what their desirable learning outcomes are for their particular course? to advance composition uh, in the English department and so what I get is I, I have a lot of students who are going into teaching, pre-service teachers, and I'm thinking, you know, it's writing intensive, they have to get a C or better, or they have to repeat the class, they can't graduate. And I'm thinking, 
Okay, so my objectives in the class are that students would perform research on a topic that they have a connection to that is going to have a payoff as far as their career. So if they're going into teaching elementary school, then maybe they're interested in autism or behavior modifications or learning styles or something like that. So they're already researching. My goals for the class is, are uh, research something that's going to have a payoff for you, be able to... Uh, understand the sources that you find in when you're doing the research and then produce arguments to several different audiences for several different purposes. So we're writing several different types of writing. The challenge in that class that I always have is I ask students to do a synthesis of their research and so uh, maybe only 30 percent of the students really get what the synthesis is and produce that and they really struggle and I've found many different ways to teach it through analogy and a whole bunch of other stuff but when they go to write that paper they're just summing up they're not synthesizing um, so I was thinking about this and writing down this how could I incorporate service learning into this course and I thought it's writing intensive they're going into teaching, some of them are doing their observations while they're in this class that perhaps my first thought was this is not a good class to have service learning. But as we talked, I realized they are doing service learning the whole time, it just maybe hasn't been counted as that. So if they're looking at autism or behavior modifications and they're doing their observation and they're going to school anyway, they are collecting that data, it just hasn't counted as that. And some of, some of the students who are not going into teaching who are writing on different topics, I require them to conduct interviews with experts on their topics. So in a sense, they're going to experts and they're learning from them. That could be counted as a service learning. One of my other goals for the class is that in these things that they write for various audiences, that they actually produce a few things that they could use in their portfolio when they go to get hired for a job. So even that, we were talking here, could be a service learning project. So someone who is investigating autism could create a website for other people to use in the future to pass on to other people on, you know, these are the resources to go to, these are websites that are helpful, these are techniques that are used and stuff like that. So I think that it, it's happening in my course, I just haven't labeled it as such or accredited it as such. So Great. So I know another thing, we had an organization before up in Michigan, and I'm sure there's probably got to be organizations down here. Literacy is a huge issue right now, too, and we used to be able to send out some of our students in different disciplines where um, there was a nonprofit that actually um, worked with children on writing their own stories. And so we had a lot of English majors that would meet with them. We had nursing students that would do that, and then they would do something more of a health-related topic. But there's lots of ways you could blend, you could blend that into almost any, any discipline, having them go out and whether you're partnering with a local school and doing it for like a, a day event where it's organized, you're just assigning your students, especially for those of you who have those large enrollment numbers where you have a couple hundred students, you could have them go out in a local school or work with Boys and Girls Club. Um, they're always looking for opportunities like this where you could have them working in partnership, especially if your students are doing research on those areas and they know what the trends are or you have them studying what are some of the issues in the local community they could actually be working with the local community to develop some interventions. And that's something, too, I think you could be able to link in with your English students, with your um, health science majors, nursing education. You might even want to do something together, IPE, interprofessional education, is certainly a hot topic right now, too. Um, but that's, that's another um, way that you could go about doing it, or developing those web resources for the community. Anyone else want to share what their desirable learning outcomes are? Kim? Um, I'm Kim Basquette. I'm in the exercise science program. And I teach wellness programming. So the outcomes, desirable outcomes that I have in my classes, the students have to um, identify, they do a hypothetical program, but they have to be able to identify a priority health, a health need for a particular population, whether it be the elderly, adults, children, whoever. And then they have to actually develop a program based around it. And so we, we talk about needs assessments, going in the community, um, looking at what the priority population is, looking at what their needs are, and actually looking at developing a program from beginning to end that addresses those needs within that population. So my... For me, it's hard. I have, two, I have two sections of this course every semester with 35 to 37 students per s section. So it's very difficult to try to think of doing a service learning project with this many students. 
Um, but I would love, my ideal would be to, to find a target community and actually be able to do that for them would be my ideal for a service learning project. So it fits very nicely. It's just trying to figure out how to do it. Okay. I didn't see anybody really jumping to wave their hand, so we'll move on and then hopefully everybody can kind of chime in afterwards. But ideally, if you could design your own activity, forget about what the project logistics are, forget about the, the community partner. How would you want to scale your project? Do you want to do a one-day event? Do you want it to be a semester-long experience? Do you want your students working as individuals? Is this going to be an individual project they're responsible for completing? Are you going to have them um, complete and, and work in a group? And then again, how involved do you want to be in the process? So for the needs assessment course I taught last summer, my students really drove that process. I was kind of there to guide them and provide um, guidance as they were developing materials, but they were the ones that were really driving um, the project. This summer with designing online instruction, I'm going to be a little bit more involved with them um, on this because I, I don't want anyone to go too rogue um, on the experience. We want to make sure we have resources that we can launch this fall. But again, that's another thing I think we sometimes forget about too. Ourselves as instructors, as faculty, we can get involved in the service learning projects with our students. And so in my designing online instruction class, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a group project. They're going to have other individual assignments that they have to complete on their own. But this is one opportunity where I can model to them what I want them to be able to do on their individual projects as well. So they're being provided with that necessary scaffolding and the modeling and the examples as they're getting ready to work on their own projects throughout the summer. But these are things that you want to kind of keep in mind. And then this helps us kind of start identifying potential community partners. And so when you think about identifying a community partner, are there any community organizations that you're aware of that could benefit from your class? And so just building off of the um, composition class, you mentioned um, students or pre-service teachers, maybe working with um, an autistic population. There's lots of nonprofits in this area that provide um, support and resources for people with autism. So if you can take, take a moment and think about what nonprofits, or you don't have to necessarily know their names, but are there nonprofits out there that you think offer services that you could link to your class? And I'm going to give you a few ways you can kind of cheat and expedite the process. There's an organization called Charity Navigator, and if you go to charitynavigator.org, it lists all a bunch of, like I think almost every single nonprofit in the United States. And it lets you know what they do. It certifies um, their credibility as a nonprofit, because we also want to make sure we're ensuring the safety of our students. But every nonprofit's listed under Charity Navigator. Every major city has a United Way, and almost every single nonprofit in a city is linked and is an affiliate of the United Way. So another way, if you don't have a nonprofit in mind, if you were to contact your local United Way and talk to their volunteer coordinator, they're probably going to be able to provide you with a list of organizations. You might even have it on their website that you can, um, you can sift through them. Um, I also have a link um, to all the nonprofits in the Hampton Roads area. And there's over, I want to say there's about 100 to 200 organizations. So um, at the end of this, if you want to send me an email, I'm more than happy to share that resource with anybody. And I'll have my contact information on the last slide. Um, there's also the Virginia Campus Compact. So Campus Compact, they're, they're spread out throughout the country. But this is where a lot of universities, and this is the Virginia one, all the universities in Virginia that do service learning and do civic engagement and volunteerism, they all get together. And they have this little cohort. And so there's opportunities there to see what other people are doing. They usually do regional conferences. It's a great opportunity to get ideas for service learning or to see how your class might be able to partner up with other classes if they have a coalition going on and they want to do a statewide project. And if you really don't have the time and this seems too overwhelming, ask Emily. And so I already told Emily I was going to be putting this up there a few different times. Um, Emily has the resources and she's very eager and willing to work with people. And so she's, if you don't know, if you, even if you come in and say, this is my class, and this is what I'm thinking about doing, and I want to find a nonprofit that does this, she'll either know of one already, or she'll be able to put you in touch with that organization. And so it's really good, too, because rather than you necessarily um, contacting somebody and just saying, you know, hi, I'm a faculty member from Old Dominion University, they might already have a relationship with ODU. And if anyone's going to know that, it's going to be Emily's office or the Office of Community Relations. 
So they're going to be able to help you out with that as well, or may, might be able to make that um, introduction for you and put you in touch with the, with the right people that are actually going to be able to help you with your project. A couple of things you got to think about too, the location of the nonprofit, depending on what you're doing for your service learning experience. Do you want them to do something that's near the student? Do you want them to do something that's near campus? Or do you want to do something that's 100% virtual? And there are a lot of nonprofits, even if you're teaching um, at a distance or you have students that are scattered, there are a lot of nonprofits where, um, you, even if it's a local nonprofit, you could still coordinate with them and have your distance students participating, especially if they're developing resources or educational materials or, or coming up with some type of campaign for them. There's a lot of things that people can do at a distance. I sat through a lot of different projects where people were talking about global health. They were talking about we have, um, we have global health issues in our own backyard too, and so we don't always have to travel um, far away. We can actually find things that are local too. So um, there's opportunities for students, even those that are kind of scattered where they can do this. Um, you may implement a project where you might um, task your students, kind of like with what I did with my consulting class, they have to go out and find their client. And so they just have to come back and let me know who are they working with. And so I had, at the time when I taught this class, I had about 15, 16 students. They're all working with 15, 16 different organizations. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind too. So that way you don't have to worry about coordinating all that. You set up the, you set up the requirement and then they're just responsible for kind of um, filling you in and, and keeping you in the loop on what's going on that way. And as long as you have strict parameters and you've given them clear objectives for the assignment, you're not going to have any issues where people are coming back and the project just does not make sense or it doesn't fit with your course objectives. Memorandums of understanding. Um, I'm sure anybody here who's done global health, you probably had to fill out memorandums of understanding or you have your students filling out the contracts. Um, if you're working with a nonprofit um, organization, word of advice, call it an MOU, call it a memorandum of understanding. You use the word contract, you scare people away. They're gonna bring in their lawyers and it's gonna become a huge issue. Um, and again, administration here will kind of let you know if you have a question on should, should you have a contract, they'll let you know. But for a lot of these service learning projects that we do here, an MOU will suffice. Um, and, and why do we have one? Oh. I'm working with legal right now to develop a template for service learning courses for our MOUs. So, coming. So again, as we said before on the previous slide, ask Emily. Um, but one of the things that um, you want to make sure that you're covering, when, when you're talking with your, with your client and you're identifying a project, you want to make sure that you're setting up clear objectives with them too. You want to make sure that you're, meeting, that you're meeting their needs, but they're not going to be aware necessarily of what your individual course needs are. And so you want to make sure that you're keeping that balance and that, because yeah, um, oftentimes when you go into a nonprofit, very rarely will they tell you, we don't need help. Usually they're going to give you so many different ideas that you're going to get inundated and you're not even going to know where to start. And so it's really helpful to kind of keep going back and saying, these are my course objectives. Let's focus on this this semester. Maybe next semester we can do something else. It's really important too to talk about the boundaries of the project, um, especially with designers for learning. When we're talking to clients about projects, myself and Jennifer Madrell, we, we talk in semesters because we're faculty and we know if we're having students, it's within a semester. The rest of the world doesn't talk like that. They're, they're looking at this, they, they don't necessarily understand why we can't do a year long project or a year and a half project. We're thinking going, okay, how can, I, how can I carry this through two different semesters with two different classes? And so those are things that you wanna keep in mind too. You wanna keep in mind the time, the time frame. Um, the roles on the project, the, um, the client, the instructor, and the student. So I see the students usually driving these projects. It's my job to provide them with guidance and support and feedback and to be the one in the background kind of reminding them of the relevance to this of the course concepts. But you also want to make sure that you, you're clear as to what the role of the, of the client's going to be. Um, I've had experiences before where we've worked with a nonprofit um, partner and they've disappeared. They gave us everything and they said, okay, we want you to work on this project and then we have students asking them questions or we're trying to get information from them and they've gone missing. We don't know, we don't know where they're at. They're not responsive or they're, you know, they're busy and they haven't checked their email or they haven't responded to our email and it's now four or six weeks and our students are stuck and can't move forward with their projects. So you wanna make sure what's really good about the memorandum of understanding or at least having those project objectives up front is that you can let them know we're going to need you um, to meet. 
And so, um, for instance, when we did the needs assessment class, Emily was our client, and I knew that I had a 12-week semester. I knew I wanted Emily to be able to meet with my class, I think, two different times, or no, three different times um, throughout the semester. We set up those dates ahead of time. We knew she was going to have to review data collection materials that had to align with when my assignments were due. And so we knew all that ahead of time. So nothing ever came up, if I don't think, where it was a surprise. She knew right away, okay, we're going to have to do this, this, and this. There's nothing wrong with letting the community partners know when you're going to need their help or their support. Because again, we want to make sure that we're building a reciprocal relationship. And then again, too, depending on what certain things, what, depending on the organization that you're working with, intellectual property, especially this kind of comes up if we're developing certain technological pieces, education. Sometimes people want to copyright their own curriculum that they're developing. This is where that might come into play. I haven't really seen it be too much of an issue with service learning projects but some, some MOUs that I've seen at different institutions have, have covered that. And then again, there's oftentimes there's confidentiality statements. Um, I've had students before that have been working with nonprofits that provide support and resources for, for children who have been abused. Um, so those are things that we want to make sure that they're not disclosing that information. Sometimes there, um, there's HIPAA information that they're being um, provided. We want to make sure that they're not reporting that. Um, and so depending on the organization and depending on what your course is and what the project is, you want to make sure that that's really clear as well. The other thing that you also want to be um, aware of when you're identifying a community partner, there are some community partners that are going to require your students to go through volunteer training. And so anyone who's ever volunteered at a nonprofit organization, sometimes they'll say to you, you've got a 10 hour training session we want you to go through. That might throw a wrench in things if your students or your class are trying to do a service learning project and the organization's not willing to waive that. And so, for instance, one of the um, organizations I worked with up in Michigan that provided resources to abused children had a mandatory 40-hour volunteer training program that we, we could not ignore. And our students had, we, they had to do it just because of the nature of things. We worked with a homeless shelter that provided counseling and resources to victims of rape. There was, a, a, I think, a 30-hour training component there. We, we, could, we couldn't leave that just because of the nature and the sensitivity of what our students would be exposed to and, and who they would be working with. Um, but there are times where nonprofits will, will waive that. They'll say it's not necessary. They might even be willing to come to your class or put together an information packet for your students that would kind of catch them up in terms of whatever you're working on. But those are things that you want to find out too. What types of clearance do they need depending on, on how you're handling things? But again, if ODU already has an existing relationship with an organization, ask Emily. She'll know, you know what types of training might be needed. And there we go, we've got her contact information again. There's, you've got a lot of pictures. When I, when I Googled Emily Eddins, there's a lot of pictures that came up. So. so then we talk about assessment. How do we assess service learning projects? And oftentimes people look like a deer in headlights. And so when we talk about assessment, here's a couple of things that you can do. I set up course contracts with my students um, partly because it's good to be clear with the objective. The other part is I don't trust a lot of people and I don't want the student coming back at the end of the semester saying, I had no idea what was expected of me. I didn't realize I had to do this. And so what I do here, um, for example, this was with our um, the consulting class. Um, we had a client description. So I, I have them describe the context, that they're, how, how their project is going to occur. What is it that they're going to do? Now this is where the students were really driving their own consulting project. This is something that you could fill in yourself and, and provide them. But you're going to let them know what the goals of the project are. Under goals, it's always a great opportunity, again, to highlight the relevance, because we can't do this enough. Make sure that you're highlighting and letting them know this is going to help you learn, and, and whether you're referencing one of your, your course objectives um, from your syllabus. You're going to be clear as to what the service deliverables are. If it's volunteering or they're, they're going to have to um, participate in a couple of events and you have actually specific dates and times, you want to put that in there too. You want to let them know what the project management protocols are going to be, which we'll talk about in a minute. Because oftentimes we can do that through reflection. Are you going to have them follow up? I know somebody mentioned before, um, I think it was one of the interprofessional education panels was talking earlier this morning, and they said they had, their students had an entire semester to do this. So when you tell a student that they have an entire semester to do this, and it's January, they're going to put it off a little bit. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're constantly following up. So how can we embed certain check-in points um, for them to let us know, OK, I haven't disappeared. I'm working on things. And then student reflection parameters. 
What this does is when you outline the course contract with the students and you have them sign it or say, okay, I understand, I agree to this, this gives you the components of your rubric that you can use for, for grading. Because now it's very clear. Did, did they meet the deliverables? To what extent did they meet the deliverables? Did they do the reflections? Did they, did they, did they follow, did they do the check-in points? And you kind of have a shell or the outline for your rubric. And again, linking back when we talk about goals for the project, we can link that back to your course objectives too, so then you can show that you've got assessments for your course objectives. So when we look at reflection, this is where we're looking at the what. And so in reflection, what we can do is you want to have your students, you want to see what your student perceptions are. You want them um, to provide you with a progress summary. This, is, this comes in handy more so for the projects that are going to be a little bit longer, they're going to last a couple of weeks throughout the semester. Um, you want them to tally their hours and let you know how much time have they spent working on different tasks. Um, you want to be able to have them be able to scope changes. Having them reflect throughout the semester allows you to fix any hiccups that may, may come up. And, and some projects they will, and some projects everything will be smooth sailing. But if there are any issues or your students have any concerns, you can immediately respond to them. And again, you can have your students um, share with you any surprises when they have those aha moments and they realize, they realize that there's that connection, there's that bridge between the real life experience and the course concept. One of the best ways to do this actually is through Blackboard. Um, I've done, um, Blackboard has a journal feature and so you can set up the journal feature where it's private so it's only between the student and the instructor. Um, what I had in one of my classes, I had students journaling, they had to provide me with weekly updates just because of the nature of the project and I was able to review them and, and respond to them. Once students started realizing I was actually reading the, the journals and was giving them feedback and helping them, they started using them more frequently. Um, but that's a great um, way to do that. Um, the other um, way you can do it too, we were talking before too about Google Drive, doing Google Docs. I've, I've had it before where I've asked my students, you know, every week they've had um, online journals on Google Drive, they have to share them with me. They know what the questions are, I give them certain prompts for what I want them to report on that week. And then what I tell them I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a different font. And so usually by the end of the semester, let's say I'm typing all in, in red and they're, and they're typing everything in black, you're going to notice there's a, a lot of color going on um, by the end of the semester because they're realizing now we're, we've engaged in a conversation. It's also a really good opportunity too and you've got a really good archive if you ever want to do a retrospective research study as students are kind of coming up with reflective practice and those aha moments and you're trying to see how they're making those connections. Um, you could also look at doing content analysis with that as well, of course, after you go through the IRB. Reflection, it's going to vary. So when I've done the consult, my consulting class, I have them reflecting weekly because there's so much work that's involved. You may choose to have them do it um, at milestones. You may have them choose to do it as things happen. When they have those aha moments, you might want to put in a minimum that they have to complete the first reflection by a particular date. Maybe you have them follow up two or three times. And again, this, this will vary depending on, on the nature of things. And then where? We've got individual journals, semi-public journals, and public blogs. Um, when I did interprofessional education with medical students and nurses, we actually did focus groups where we brought them together and it was really interesting because um, I think it was a very humbling experience for our second year medical students because they, they don't do too many clinical skills until they start doing their clerkships in their third and fourth year. And so um, it was humbling for them when the nursing students actually had more experience doing clinical skills because they already are, they're already going on clinical rotations where they were educating them and it really helped them understand what the other profession was doing and how to really take it as a, uh, treat it as a team approach. And so that was one way where we kind of just did, we just did focus groups with them. We brought them in, it gave them an opportunity to see what the other discipline was, was doing and learning. And I know that's kind of been a, a, a constant um, theme we were hearing in a lot of the IPE presentations. Everyone's trained in silos and we can look at that in all of our programs. We're all trained in silos, we know what our programs are responsible for, we don't always see what everybody else um, is teaching or, or learning and there's a lot, oftentimes there's a lot of opportunity for some overlap. And so when we look at this here, we've got our course con contract equals the rubric and then examples of how students are demonstrating that they're meeting those objectives could be through the student's process, student's product, 
what they're developing, and students' reflection. So right away here, you could have th three different forms of assessment going towards your service learning activity that you could link up to your course objectives. Depending, too, on how you're doing it with grading, you set this up and you structure that they're reporting on it on three different times throughout the semester. You've got three assignments that could really take up a large chunk of your, of your, um, your course. And that you're not just waiting until the end of the semester and grading something. Other forms of assessment, peer input, client input, and student input. Now, if the students are going to have more of a one-to-one -one relationship with the client, where the client will actually be able to tell you, you know, student A did this for me or student B did that, that's great um, information to be able to factor in. I wouldn't factor that solely in saying, like, the client is grading their assignment and that's what their grade's going to be based on, but I would certainly use that information to see was the client satisfied with the product that they delivered? Did the, you know, are they telling you that the student showed up on time? Um, are you seeing that the, that the student has um, developed a product that's, that's solid? Peer input, if we have group projects, or you have students working with other programs, having them comment and provide feedback as to what it was like working with the other disciplines, that's another form of assessment too. And so what I want you to think about right now is let's go back. We talked about earlier, how would you scale your project? Who here is thinking about doing a group project? Would you mind sharing what the group project might be? I'm still trying to figure it out. I teach a career planning class, and we have the students focus on like identifying their interests, their skills, their values, and, I, and we take them on visits, but I thought that a way to get them to really focus in on what they're good at and what they're interested in is to have them actually do something. So I was thinking about because they're mostly freshmen, to make it a group project. But I don't know exactly what the project would be, so any feedback would be great. Um, but I was thinking maybe based on areas that they're thinking. So if I, if, I ha if I put the people together by their interest areas, so people that are interested in business might have a project that was more related to something in business. If they're interested in education, it'd be sort more related to education, so there might be multiple like small projects in the class. I don't know though. One of, my one of my suggestions off the top of my head is if you're working with freshmen, maybe trying to pair them up where they're working with, um, with high school students. And they could almost, if they're, if they're looking at career planning, they're trying to see what, what skills that they're good at that way. Maybe it's putting on something, working with high school students, incorporating some form of mentorship. Um, local libraries are a really great way to do that too, where you could contact a local library or a couple of local libraries and say you were doing some type of career planning night. Um, and depending on how you structure it, you could have your students going out and doing different things and, and marketing it that way. There's, we've had really good results that way too with local libraries, and they do a lot of marketing for you already too. Um, that's already kind of built in, but that might be an example of something too. Uh, Emily? You, so we have some, a lot of organizations, well not a lot, but yeah, some organizations that work with um, military families and, and um, military folks that are coming back, going back into the workforce. You could flip it on, on the head for the students and have the students work with those kind of organizations that, that mentor others in their own career development. And then that could be kind of a backwards process for them so they could help them explore other people exploring their careers. Does that make sense? And again, it's that reciprocal community relationship where the community partner is helping our students too because they're mentoring them. And you could have your students are going to work with them in partnership to, to contribute to something or to work on a project. How would you assess that? I don't want putting you on the spot. <laughs> how, how might she assess it? We'll open it up to the whole group. <laughs> you could certainly, if you're going to have them do something like that and you had them working on it throughout the semester, I think it would be good to kind of have them um, be re having them reflect. So we have, um, in, in my field, we've, we've got competencies that our professional organization has laid out. And you can kind of take a survey and it lets you know what your, 
you know, based on how you report on it, you know, where your strengths and weaknesses are. I had my students do that beforehand and build in their course goals for what they wanted to achieve with their consulting projects. And then at the end of the semester, I had them do it again. Just because I wanted them to be able to compare to see, okay, I, I, this was a weakness before, now it's saying I'm, I'm average now. Or this was a weakness before, now it's saying it's one of my strengths. Um, but that might be an opportunity too, especially if you're going to have them self-identify what they what they think that they're they're good at or what they want to do. Um, you could you could structure um, journal questions regarding that too to say, you know, are you good at that? Have you had a change of mind? Because sometimes we don't know until we do something. We realize, okay, that's not for me. Um, anyone else want to share an activity that they were thinking about? I was thinking um, this summer. This summer I'm teaching uh, composition two to eleven. And uh, it's only a six or eight week class, so we really don't have a lot of time. But when I teach that class, I usually focus on food issues, like environmental or health issues related to food. So I thought that maybe what I could do is organize uh, a project where my students actually visit like Five Points Farmer's Market or Farmer's Market or Whole Foods and a, gro and a grocery store and do some observation field notes on, you know, what types of foods they have and what percentages of types of food, whole foods versus processed foods and stuff like that, but also take some notes and observe the clientele and also do some research where they're actually looking at the mission statements of the various types of stores and then analyze that and have some reflection on that. And I, th I think that could be, you know, they could produce a web page or a blog or a Facebook page or something like that to inform other people about their eating connections and food and stuff. We had a project before we were working on involving food insecurity and what we had our students doing, we were working with one of the local schools where I, I want to say 60% of the students were getting a free free lunch and so what we did is we actually put together a cookbook for them. So we, we tasked all of our students with coming up with how could you come up with, they each had to come up with like three or four different recipes that would feed a family of four um, under um, $10 and then we even had challenges for under $5 and, and the first time that we did it some of our students struggled with this because they were adding things in like spices and stuff like that and we said well, you know you go to the grocery store you're going to be spending five or six bucks on you know oregano if you're buying like a jar but you're not going to spend like you know 20 cents on it or anything like that and so they really had to start thinking about what they would um, what they would pick and so they had to get creative with it and then what we did was after um, they were doing reflections on it. They were reflecting on how difficult it was, which also led to the point where when we see a lot of people sometimes are eating a lot of fast food, sometimes it's cheaper that way. And we actually had um, a mother had said it was easier for her to take her kids to McDonald's because she could get them a hamburger, um, you had your protein, they were getting their carbs, um, french fries was a vegetable, and then she got them high C, which was juice. That's how they were factoring it in with the fruit. But when you were looking at how much it would cost for her to have gone to the grocery store and, bought, and buy a meal like that, um, it's going to cost a lot more than what she paid at McDonald's. But that was the rationale that was being used. And so what they were tasked with was to try and find ways we could integrate this. And so what we did was we provided the cookbook. We had our um, nutritionist who was working at the medical school at the time reviewed stuff. And then we made sure that it was approved and everything. We put it together and we provided it to the, to the school. And what we did was we put it in a PDF file so it was made available to all of the parents so that we also weren't pointing out which kids needed free lunch or which people needed to have those cheaper recipes. It was just a resource that was put out there for everybody. Um, so that could be an example of something too. And that's something that they can do. You can link it into your courses. Um, again, if they're doing the observations and kind of seeing things in that neighborhood and you have them going out, that's fine too. If they're distance students, task them with going out to their local um, grocery store on their own and describing um, the setting and then having them go out and describe, you know, describe that population, um, see if it matches up with you know, city demographics, and then have them create something as well. That's, that's something else you can do too. Kind of tied to both of those uh, concepts. National Geographic has some great resources on food deserts. And so for my medical geography class this upcoming semester, I'm going to have the students go out in the community and geocode where 7-Elevens are and then compare that to where Farm Fresh or Kroger or whatever other grocery stores around the neighborhood and then talk about the demographics, the socioeconomics, the people that are in those communities and talk about food deserts in that context. Also kind of getting them out in the community to, to look at some landscapes and make their own conclusions based upon those experiences. And I, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot. How are you planning to assess that to see if we're meeting a community need? I don't know yet. It's still in the 
preliminary stage. Okay, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Does anyone have any ideas for that? Um, did you say your course was online? Or do you have distance students? Is face to face? Well, both of you guys. Um, I just went to a conference of, of, about a month ago, and there's a panel, or there's a um, big, um, I guess, a big panel that that the first lady of Virginia has actually started. That's that's trying to bridge the nutritional divide in the state of Virginia. And one thing they're looking at is food deserts, and then looking at where fresh fruits and vegetables are located. And that could be something that you could actually incorporate too, is just going around and assessing. You know what? Where, where are, where they live? Where do, where can you access fresh fruits and vegetables? Are you looking at Seven Elevens? What do they offer? You know, because that's what a lot of people in food deserts. That's all they have, you know, accessible to them is is fast food or the um, convenience stores. So maybe another way you could look at it is, is kind of seeing, you know, not looking at the, the big picture, but kind of like where are the healthy foods located, and um, assessing. I guess they could write a reflection. They could write up what they what they found, you know, are there fresh fruits and vegetables, or are they mainly processed foods, what do they have versus what they should have, and kind of assess it that way with the reflection piece to it. Other things too you could have them do, especially because I know we've got a lot of pre-service teacher programs here at ODU, but you could tie it into any discipline really. If you were to have students go out and do education programs going out into the local schools, and then you can have your, there's a lot of times you can buy um, curriculum that already exists and have the students practice delivering a, a 20 minute workshop to a class or a 20 minute presentation to a class or even doing a workshop in a class and then having the students reflect on it. Um, I've had students before where they've had to go to local elementary schools and they were surprised in their reflections. We got really good ones where they'd say, I'm surprised that little kids know so much or they actually had a couple of little kids that corrected them when they made a mistake um, and they realized, you know, how receptive children are. Um, we had other um, uh, students that were shocked when they realized how little some of these kids knew and we, we assumed that people knew certain things and they didn't or just some of the comments that were made. Well, my mom and dad said and, you're, and they're sitting there going, that's what they're being told at home. But it, it was very eye-opening for them which as they were developing interventions later on and learning how are they going to, you know, approach this subject when they graduate or they move on to their next course, kind of had them more aware of their, of their environment as well. Um, those are examples of that too. Um, I know a lot of the health science programs and even human movement sciences, I know the American Heart Association does a ton of stuff. They do a ton of stuff right now with local schools and, and nutrition and building greenhouses and gardens. They also do their hoops, hoops for hearts and they do um, jump rope um, for your heart and there's lots of just day events you could have um, your students do as well. Um, you could also have your students working with um, local um, senior centers. I know the Norfolk Senior Center, I actually had a student last fall did a project for them looking at improving, um, and again, it's instructional design. She was looking at ways she could improve their instructional strategies and assessments for how they were delivering certain exercise courses to their senior population. And so because a lot of people that are training, they, they weren't trained as instructional designers and they had some materials that they were putting together and she just kind of refined some of that for them. So there's lots of opportunities where you could have your students go out. If you're teaching human development or a psychology class and you want students to get exposure to different um, populations, you could have them go out there too and, and, and do certain types of activities. So again, it doesn't have to be anything where they have to create something all on their own or that you have to create, you know, a whole bunch of different projects. It would be very easy to say, okay, we're going to go to the libraries um, these, these two or three days or, or this month and we want you to divide and conquer and you're going to handle these areas or we want you to develop resources on these types of things. Any of those group projects you have them do at the end of the semester, tie in a, a community component to it on how they could implement this in their actual community. Um, and then you've got service learning there as long as you deliver it to a community partner. Anyone else want to share any ideas that they're thinking about? For Anyone have any other cool ideas for assessments? I was just thinking in your writing, you could have op-ed pieces for the paper. You could go and then take polls. You can go and write letters to the legislature. Um, and that way, if there is no good healthy food, you take that research that you found and then you go back to the community with it. Because it's all about making sure it, it's disseminated because there's a lot of good things that come out of our classes that no one ever sees afterwards. Dominion. 
And the food choices, I've had some students look at that, food choices that are here on campus, you know, for vegans and for vegetarians and for people who want whole foods. And so they're actually critiquing that. We haven't done it as a service learning project, but students are very interested mm -hmm. in that topic and looking at what, you know, is here or not here. We've got a local radio station too. We had students, you could develop PSAs and oftentimes they're looking for filler. Um, the local um, university radio stations are looking for filler. Usually they need a 60 minute, P uh, sorry, a 60 second PSA or a 90 second PSA and they have to have so many um, on air um, every hour. And so oftentimes they're looking for new ones. So depending on what your course is, you could offer a PSA to provide awareness to something or it could be a, a hot topic. Um, that, that's another thing that you could have your students um, work on as well. Uh, oh. Real quick, um, speaking of nutrition, uh, my cousin, she, she does a, uh, in Pennsylvania, she's, she's very young, starting her own uh, business. But she noticed that the community and the schools had a lot of the um, non-nutritional elements to their menu. And so she's gone out and tried to do resources on her own to try to find more nutritional uh, ways and options to bring the food to the school. Well, the help that she had um, before kind of went out on her. So she's been doing a lot of stuff on her own. So in this conversation that I'm hearing, she may be a resource where sh students can reach out to what she's doing to help with that, pr that what she's trying to do. So I'm going to get with Emily. <laughs> Absolutely. So. And, that's, and that's a good example, too, of e-service learning because you would have a, a community partner at a distance. Mm -hmm. But that's something you could easily do where you have her, like, again, we've had people come in as the client. You set up a, a WebEx meeting, or I, I've set up a Skype meeting that I've recorded, so I'm asking certain questions, and then they're, they're, pr they're presenting the case. They're saying this is what we need so that the students can access it on their own um, you know, when, when they're logging in and looking at things. Or you could have them you know, channel in during a live class if it's face-to-face -face as well. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. But that's a, that's a good, and then, then ask Emily you know, after Tracy gives those contacts. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. Oh, and also, from an assessment standpoint, um, no matter what class you decide to go with, um, I, there is this service learning student course evaluation that is pretty comprehensive. I think it's like an 80-point um, survey, and it's, that information will automatically be um, given back to you once it's completed. And, and uh, yeah, so there's that. Also, there are tons of, if you just Google service learning food farm, whatever. I mean, there are tons of options out there, farm farm to schools and campus kitchen. And mm -hmm. it also drives me crazy that I can't buy a banana in the web center. <laughs> you know, those are the I can't find Chef Boyardee yet either. So right. <laughs> <laughs> we're dealing with a picky eater. But <laughs> is there anyone here right now who teaches a class who says there's no way I could implement service learning in my class? So it's in introduction to literature, and I teach that face to face. I'm gonna be teaching that in the fall. I have three sections of that, and I have a hard time seeing how I could do that with that class. Thirty five students per section, three sections. You could have them go out. The local libraries do a lot of different programs with with kids, um, and you could have them. You could partner with the local library and have them spend time whether they're they're reading with children. They're always looking for reading buddies or the schools do reading buddies, or you could even have them where they're writing little short stories in, in the classes or in the libraries. And I've got a contact for you too if you want to do that. I've got a contact in the libraries because yeah. we've been doing research on that as well. Also, the woman at CNU that started service learning at CNU um, is like the national expert in um, service learning in literature. So there's that. You can do it. <laughs> okay. I've got, I've got one for you. I teach U.S. history, also a survey course with 35 students every semester face-to-face. -face. How do you service learn in history? I, oh, I can do oh. experiential, oh, but, we, you know. Well, service learning, what you could do is you could partner. I know that there's um, partner with one of the military organizations or the vets or the career transitions and then mm -hmm. have them put together resources to educate the kids about the history, right. or you can work with um, any of the local museums here, like the Nauticus, they're open to things, developing things with QR codes. Right. So as you're like walking around and, and you're interested in a topic and you want more information, have everyone's got their phones on them when they're going through museums and stuff. Right. You could scan that and you could kind of link something in that way. And Bobette at the cemeteries, um, the city of Norfolk, um, I, she's a 
it's over there on that sheet, the full name, but she is wonderful and she would love, she, she's actively looking for projects. Yeah. Okay, give us another one. We're, we're, we're on, we're on fire right now, Emily. <laughs> oh, one idea for history is that you could do oral histories, especially with veterans in the area. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have one, so I'm with Averett University in Danville, and we have one ins English instructor. Um, she's been doing this course once a year, and she has students uh, partnered with a veteran. They meet about five times for an hour each, and, you know, they document and interview them. And then um, at the end, she's going to be publishing um, a history of Danville veterans uh, based on this course. A lot of the veterans are open to coming to campus, and then you could probably work with Emily to figure out transportation and logistic issues. Uh, she's shaking her head. <laughs> um, and then for the, the English one, um, there's like a lot of research out there about using um, service as a text. So I know a lot of times it's hard for um, students to get excited about a certain topic. You know, you, you tell them they can write about anything, and they're like looking at you like deer caught in headlights, like that picture you had up there. Um, but if you go out and you work with a partner, um, so, like, even if it's like a battered women's shelter or something, and then you talk about different elements of that one social issue, they could all take different topics to write about and research or whatever for their introduction to English course, and you know, it can just grow from there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one of the things is building on your history um, project, if you were to do that, even maybe trying to partner up with somebody in the College of Communications to have them film them, because I know in one of my instructional design professional organizations, they wanted to start capturing the history with some of the, the more prominent people in the field as they were retiring. And so they were at our annual conferences, they were you know, asking a series of questions about their experiences and stuff. Now, the people didn't like that because they knew that they were getting old when they started getting solicited because they wanted the people that were on, on the verge of, of leaving the field. But there's a lot of different groups you could probably do that um, with here in the local area. Just real quick too, to address instructional design, um, history and English. Um, I don't know if y'all visited Quantico Museum. They have a lot of narrative scripts to their description. So you hear it, you can read it. So it's very accessible for those um, with special needs and, or you know, accessibilities. And so that's something that's a project that I know that all museums do not have. And a lot of universal design that does not happen in a lot of your um, tourist areas where a lot of inaccessibility does happen. So those are some of the things that I've noticed in, uh, that all three can be addressed. Hello, am I up? I see it being passed around back there. Um, how about I teach the physics of nuclear medicine? <clears throat> I, thank you. Take the mic, take the mic, no. <laughs> That's the exact response I get from the students. No, no, I, tell us about your class though, what do, what do you teach? I think I'm the community service. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I don't know how to do it. I thought about it, now in my Clinical classes, I mean, they're in clinic eight hours a day. I mean, they're working without pay, learning, and they're helping the community. So I think we do plenty in health sciences. But um, I'd like to do something more. In the past, I've taught them how they learn the, the epidemiology of a disease like juvenile arthritis and what we do for scans, and then we'll run the on-campus run for, and we'll raise money for this. But, you know, now that I've seen that Nadine Cruz's talk, I think, you know, we're number 12 on the list of 12 things is donating 50 bucks to United Way. Now I don't feel so good about the thousands that we've raised. I, I feel like joining the army. But, but, uh, but I think our, mine was low learning and low service. It was a one-shot deal. And I, I feel like what she was saying, it's got to last 10 years. So I don't know what to do. So I'm going to give up. Thank you. No, 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 no. No, no I'm just kidding. Yeah. I think, well, one of the things I would think of right now, too, there's so many initiatives out there, too, about like STEM education. It's STEM, STEM, STEM everywhere, and we're trying to promote things. We're trying to promote mentoring with um, students in, in underserved populations and trying to get them to go to college and do things. There's something you could probably do, like, I don't know anything about nuclear medicine. You could probably have your class put something together. How would you educate the community? Why, do, I, why is nuclear medicine or nuclear? Important. Um, important. It's great. I just spoke at Kellum High School has a STEM education and they had me come speak and I thought, you know, my students could do this. Mm -hmm. So you're saying maybe get them involved to go to the high schools? Yeah. There's huh. also um, Girl Scouts of Colonial Coast here. They cover all of um, the Hampton Roads area and parts of North Carolina and then the local Boy, um, Boy Scouts and they do a lot of stuff too with, with different um, universities and partnerships. 
they've got a program that they call, I think it's like Tech Bridge. At least I know that's what the Girl Scouts were doing. And they're constantly looking for people to come in and build new learning modules where you could go out to um, a Girl Scouts meeting and they, they'll do things where they teach them about a, t a technology topic or they do environmental science. You probably come up with something with new, with, um, involving nuclear medicine and have them do it. And, and they've got um, curriculum. If you go on their websites, you can actually see what the curriculum is that they're currently doing. So you could see how you could kind of you know, tone it down um, for, for a younger audience. But that, that's something that you could probably have them do. Also, um, you know how we run blood drives on campus? Um, so I know the uh, Red Cross is kind of struggling with different, or it, it's usually student organizations that put them on, but they would really love some um, service learning class to have teach different student organizations how to better run the blood drives on campus and create a structure. Okay, cool. That's a big L, big S on that way of thinking. Okay, right. But there's, there's, there's lots of different, um, oh, okay, another one. <laughs> uh, hi, Vukit Sivanis from Engineering Technology. I took multiple students. When I was going to these STEM events, I went to seven in the last two years. But my, my issue is if now I'm teaching completely online class and I have 31 of them. So in, in their different locations. So, you know, what kind of service activity you can give to someone who is anywhere? You know, so it's not your personal client. I, that for me, that's personally very challenging. You right? could look too at what you, what you did locally, depending on, on how you were, what, you, what projects you're having them do, and maybe you put, have them participate in um, working with distance learning here and putting on a, a webinar or doing something with WebEx and they could offer it to people and so your students could connect and present on different things and then you could open it up to a lot of people in the community um, and, and, you, and obviously it can extend to outside of the Hampton Roads area as well. Um, but just in the interest of, is there any more? We'll take one more. Okay, one more and then we'll. Uh, yeah, and how about the beginning level of foreign languages? Foreign I languages? Yeah, I teach Japanese, she teach French, beginning level. We did things with we did things with translation or even looking at working again the local libraries are always open to having different types of events. It could be like a, a, a two part series where you're you're having them go out and teach people different um, different things about that particular language or having them having them coach. Um, that's that's another way that you could do it too. You could have them partner up too with any of the different language clubs at the different um, at the you know elementary and post secondary or sorry elementary and secondary schools too. I did start uh, the Language in Motion last fall, and so that's where um, our student ODU students who have studied abroad go out to K through 12 schools and talk about the importance of learning a mm -hmm. language. So, but I called it outreach program. So maybe I should have them reflect on it. What yeah. did they learn from from their, their from the students that they were interacting with? Right, did people even know about certain languages? That that's part of it too, and, and it's getting that awareness out there. Um, but I think if I have to leave you with a final thought, my final thought is to get rid of the disposable assignments. If we can kind of um, task ourselves with making a concerted effort to have assignments that add value to the community, our students are going to remember them. It's going to have a, a, a lasting impact. Because we all know we can always probably find, if we look through our syllabus, we all have those busy work assignments. And certain ones are needed for certain concepts. And other times look at, can we fit in a service learning component? Can we substitute one of these disposable assignments and incorporate something that can benefit the community. And so there's really five things you really need to remember when you're leaving here. Number one, constantly remind students about the relevant. So again, I cannot repeat that enough. Constantly show them how this is going to link to the course objectives, how they'll be able to apply this later on when they, when they graduate and leave ODU, how they could add this to their, their resumes, or they can add this to their student portfolios. You want to make sure that you plan ahead. This is not something that you're going to plan the week before the semester starts and say, hey, I'm going to have a service learning project. You want to make sure now's the perfect time um, to start preparing, too, for the fall. And certainly don't prepare for the summer because we've just started. But um, again, you want to constantly revisit the course goals and assessments because even if you meet with a community partner and they give you a lot of different ideas, it's very easy to get off track and to kind of lose focus. So constantly go back to say, is this activity going to meet certain goals of my course. And again, scalability. You can always expand on things later. Um, you can always, it's, it's very easy to do some of the smaller scale projects to get started. And when in doubt, ask Emily. <laughs> <laughs> and again,
again, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide my, my insights and my experiences, and I've got some resources too. So this is, this is my contact information here at um, Old Dominion. But thank you.